Up next is my conversation with Hassan Elahi. He's the head of the school of design at George Mason University outside Washington, DC. And he's best known for his work tracking transients in which he challenged uh, an FBI calling for um, being on a terrorist list by basically surveilling himself back to the FBI for the last 20 years, showing just about every meal bed and toilet he's eaten, slept in, and used. So we talk about data bodies, we talk about surveillance, we talk about discipline and control. Thanks for, I'm here with Hassan Alami, part of the uh, Sneaking Through the Mesh exhibition, and he's at George Mason University, and you will have already heard my introduction and all my fond words for Hassan and his work. And um, Let's see here. What's what's happening here is that uh, would you, for those people that aren't so familiar with your huge body of work, which is probably highly unlikely, would you mind, you know, just kind of taking us through, you know, kind of like a, a quick framing? Sure, sure. You know, so uh, I'm an artist. I work with uh, issues of surveillance, security, migration, citizenship, uh, borders, the challenges of borders, uh, and, and that type of work. Uh, so a lot of the work that's uh, probably probably my perhaps my most well known work was a project that started in uh, shortly after 9/11 uh, in 2001 when I was erroneously reported as a terrorist suspect and uh, following that erroneous report to the FBI I spent six months of my life justifying every moment of my existence and every little detail. Whereas in the end, I was eventually cleared, but since you're dealing with the magic wand of national security and terrorism, you're never really, really clear at this thing. So um, ever since then, um, I would tell my FBI agent where I was going, what I was doing. Uh, not like because I had to, but because I chose to. It was, it was right. locking in into this. And ever since then, uh, this has been going on for almost 20 years now, uh, of all these, every every meal that I've eaten and every bed that I've slept in and every toilet that I've used and every random truck stop that I've visited. Uh, there's a massive amount of information now. Interestingly enough, um, you know, now when I talk about the work and I'll show the work to uh, particularly younger folks, mm -hmm. particularly people who's, where the work is actually older than them. Right. Um, they look at it like, I don't get it. What's the big deal? This looks at my Instagram feed. And then the realization how normalized this has become. You know, when I was first starting the project, people were like, what are you doing? Why, I mean, why would you want to tell everybody every little detail? And now we all do this. We, we're all participating in this. I mean, just, just by us even being on any sort of social media, uh, we're all telling everybody every little details about us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, exactly. So what, what I'm trying to get at through curating this exhibition is what I'm seeing now, is especially with what just happened in, in last week. Um, the, the um, let's see here, um, Foucault's notion of discipline versus um, Deleuze's notions of uh, regimes of control, basically feeding into uh, Foucault's idea of, of of biopower and the nation state intersecting with what I'm uh, what I'm starting to write, what I've been writing about lately is the notion of of info power, which also Benjamin Bratton's been talking about that you know in which the information you know, superstructure is superseding the nation state and especially with the Facebook you know um, outage or now we say the Meta outage and the the rise of Meta now and this notion of metaverse. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of looking at, you know, how your work is, is so incredibly relevant to how this, you know, how the optics of the infosphere and info power basically, you know, inscribed upon individuals and that sort of thing creates this kind of this overall regime, overall regime of control. And, you know, and where, where do you, where do you see, um, Basically, what you're saying is saying is the this notion of surveillance or surveillance. And it was like you know, yeah. you know, individuals, you know, surveillance outward and that sort of thing has has become something that we used to fret about, but we don't now because it's just it's just become normalized. Yeah. And the thing is, is that where, where do you see 
when I kind of say it's like regimes of control, which want to integrate, um, you know, social control, capital control, all these things under these, you know, blanket umbrellas like Meta, um, you know, where do you see, you know, as somebody who's been working in these kind of discourses, where do you see this going? So, you know, there's a couple of interesting things that's happening. And um, it's really, at, at, at the end of it, you're dealing with the individual and then the group, you know, the, the, the center and then the peripheral. And uh, whether we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the relationship between surveillance and surveillance, which, you know, I'm uh, thinking about what Steve Mann had talked about. If you break down the word surveillance watching from above versus surveillance watching from below, Mm -hmm. So it's this re it's this shift of, of of above versus below, but then you also have this interesting thing of uh, uh, surveillance and, and voyeur and voyeurism, uh, voyeurism and, mm -hmm. and, and 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 being uh, in spectatorship or exhibitionism, yeah. exhibitionism mm -hmm. and voyeurism, uh, which is kind of interesting because when I first started this project, every uh, the only thing that was in in the media at that time was reality TV shows. Yeah. So the concept of reality television as this as this voyeuristic entry into someone's life, right? Uh, so that and and you know, I mean, really, I mean, if you look at my work, if you look at the project of Tracking Transients, it's an incredibly boring reality TV show. Uh, and when you look at people's Twitter feeds and you look at people's Instagram feeds, some of it is very boring reality TV shows. Yeah, uh, just just the format of of media uh, is a little different there. Sure. So okay, so we have spectatorship. We have uh, we, you know then 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 we also have this concept of the nation and the state, the nation, state, yeah. and the individual, right? And and you know and, and then we have the and then also the target. Uh, yeah. And so so this is this all kind of comes together in this, and I think the in the end the part of the work that I find really fascinating and it's still been going on is that as you're watching this, you do this back and forth of uh, mm -hmm. whether you're the, whether you're the, whether you're, you're the subject or you're the investigator and right. you shift back and forth in this. And, and it's kind of this thing of like, we're so embedded in this, we're all doing this. We're all, we're all complacent in this, in, you know, in this system where we are contributing and yet yes. then we are also then, trying to critique that contribution at the same time. It says, and so it's, we're playing both sides of the fence here. And uh, so in a way it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm um, by doing, by giving up all my information, by putting all the information out there, I actually live an incredibly anonymous and private life. Hmm. And what happens is if you want to look at that, if you want to make that transition from there to say warfare, which is a lot of these yeah. that's come out of. Uh, it's the idea of camouflage. Uh, I think in a, in a digital in a digital space, uh, you're not going to be able to. Uh, you you can't you can't possibly hide. You know, in the early in the early days of this project, there was this there was a possibility of if you put enough information out there, there will be so much information. Yeah. That, uh, that 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 it'll be it'll be useless, and that worked for a very small amount of time while it was still an analog system. Yeah, yeah. In the digital system, the more information you feed an AI system, the more proficient it becomes, the better it gets right. at. Right. So so it's not a sort of massive information. There's actually a drop off at, the, at a certain point where you actually don't get the the uh, the level of privacy. But what you can get is a level of um, of camouflage where it's all out there. So it basically becomes hiding in plain sight. Right. And and I think that's a really important concept, this idea of, of digital camouflage. And then which then goes in looping back to this whole thing of talking about the the individual and the nation state and then the the target and the spectator. Right. If you put all this together, what we're really looking at the next step is the physical body and the data body. And right. our data bodies are way more promiscuous than our physical bodies. Mm -hmm. Our data bodies get around a lot more with each other and interact with other data bodies, whether we're aware of it or not, than right. our physical bodies. I mean, just yeah. even this conversation that we're having right now, of course. I mean, you know, it's our data bodies that are actually engaging and interacting 
uh, exactly. physical bodies are sitting in different time zones, thousands of miles apart. Well, now hundreds. Hundreds now. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> we're, still, we're, still, we're, still, we're still over a thousand. We're still over a thousand. Okay. Okay. It's a, just saying I'm in, I'm in Minnesota and you're, you're in, on the outskirts of DC. So yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the one thing I think is kind of inter interesting about what you're getting at here is that um, in the last critical art ensemble book, you know, uh, Steve Kurtz is talking about, you know, the increasing um, complexity of the system, you know, and I think that Adam Curtis starts talking about normalization, when we, which we talked about, uh, talked about, but the idea of um, in which uh, the system reaches a point of indeterminacy in which, you know, the, the, the human the, the human system no longer is able to get at it and the thing is is that now what you're bringing into the conversation here is the idea that this is where this is this is where ai is going to kick in yeah you know it's 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 i think i think we can this is this is a complicated and a and a yeah. conflicted situation but you know, I think we have reached a point of computing where the computing has exceeded the human brain, mm. uh, the capacity, the capacity of of the computational capacity has now exceeded the human brain. Uh, okay. And, and for some of us, we might interpret that as, well, you know, I was talking about this one particular like cheese, and then next thing you know, there's an ad for it on my Instagram feed, and I can't believe my phone was listening to me. No, your phone was not listening to you. There's so many multiple levels of information that are being processed that are beyond human capacity that we actually don't, we're, we're just simply not capable of understanding things. There's only a certain levels of information that a human brain can process simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, some of these algorithms can go a million times magnifold, uh, a million times um, beyond uh, what our human capacity of computation and thinking is. Right. So I think this is one of those things that we try to kind of, um, I, I really do think we try, we try to come up with a way of trying to justify it and the human understanding of it. Mm -hmm. And it's so beyond human understanding uh, that we, we really struggle with this. And there's a, well, it must be listening to me. I mean, that's because that's the only way it makes sense. Uh, that that I got this ad after I had mentioned this, and I never actually mentioned this before. But there's other things that are happening in our lives that are actually inter in, intertwining all of these together that we're not aware of. I mean, a perfect example, perfect, perfect example that we've all dealt with, we've all been with. Um, you know, when we get our Netflix suggested shows, and you're right. like, it's like I don't, it's like I'm not going to watch that. It's like no, it's like well, what what this makes no sense. And then you start watching a, the first episode or, or the two, and you're like, oh yeah, I really do like this. Yeah. Uh, so it gets it gets really interesting in how we are looking at predictive human behavior. It gets really uncanny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we think, oh, we're smarter. We're oh, it's, it's it's just a machine. We're smart, you know. But the but I think the, the question is, is that, you know, the notion of, of intelligence and control right. and the idea, yeah. you know, in, in regards to what I'd say, the, uh, the granularity of the, you know, the, 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 the um, decoding of uh, complexity of the algorithm versus what I'd say, like the affective nature of human subjectivity. And I, I mean, these are to me, two different things. But on the other hand, is that how these things relate to these notions of um, of uh, you know living in now this you know this well, let's just say the metaverse and the idea of you know, being a, being a human being being a, a squishy wet thing you know living in the metaverse and how you know once again going back in and in, in how the you know the meat body deals with the data body and how the algorithm kind of juggles them sure sure look i mean i mean we're we're i think we're very close to a point in society where anything that can be automated will be automated sure it's going to happen it's going to happen i mean whether it's labor whether it's you know and it is going to be labor related but i think there's a lot of things that anything that can be automated will be automated i mean you look at agriculture farms today 
uh, sure. a farm that used to take, you know, a hundred people to work. Now it's like five people and a few robots. Right. Uh, you know, there's, I mean, the entire trucking industry is going to be completely transformed within the next couple of decades mm. uh, where, you know, we, we, well, we already have self-driving vehicles. Uh, right. It's a matter of, you know, just a matter of them just being a little bit more commonplace these days. Yeah. So what this really comes down to, this goes to the squishy, blobby kind of the, the meat body. Uh, what, what is the thing that actually makes us truly human? And this is the role of art. This is the role of arts. This is where, what, what are the things that truly make us human beings? And once we start asking us ourselves those questions, um, the value and the importance of arts and culture become so much paramount. And it becomes, and, and that's when arts and culture then becomes the main economy and the main, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, 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 the main uh, I, uh, thing that creates human identity. Yeah. Uh, so we yeah. will be in the, we are, we are actually as creatives, as, as artists, we are actually at a forefront of entire societal shifts that are taking place. Well, I mean, yeah, that goes right, right to, McC right to McLuhan. And, to and I totally agree with that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I'm the, and I think that you hit upon, you know, one of those fundamental, fundamental points. And, you know, the function of art is to create, it is, communication of, of a common subjectivity, you know, is, you know, create, creating two points of communication through a medium, you know, to, uh, to put forth, uh, you know, subjective experience. And the thing is, is that the algorithm is, is, is a different beast. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a digital chimera, which is not human, yeah. you know, and well, so you know, the, is, the yeah. algorithm can bring things together. And that's what right. the algorithms do, but this does it do it brings brings people together. It brings people yeah. together. It brings yeah. it brings emotions together. Yes. And those are things that you cannot automate. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot bring compassion together. No. Uh, through an algorithm. And that's what a work of art does. And a work of art moves people on an emotional state that only something that is human can do. Yeah. Yeah. Because, well, if, if we went to get a little bit strange in our, you know, in our taxonomy and saying, you know, is that the, you know, the, um, the human being is the platform, you know, from which, you know, the communication, you know, the transfer of the information is, you know, the, the, the experience is being, being done, you know, and it's, and in some ways it doesn't make sense, you know, to do, to to go otherwise, it's uh, yeah. it's a conflation of terms. But um, do you think there's a possibility that capital might, you know, want to try to conflate that? Yes, absolutely. I mm -hmm. think I think, but 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 I and but here's another really interesting thing, because artists have always been in front of capital, mm -hmm. particularly intellectual capital, right. Uh, you know, we're seeing a very quick shift right now uh, in, in society where we're seeing the value of intellectual property far exceed the value of real property. Mm -hmm. We're seeing cryptocurrencies. We're seeing uh, tech companies. We're seeing valuation of tech companies at billions of dollars within days, whereas in a previous economy, a valuation of a company uh, could be years or hundreds of years before they had a billion dollar valuation. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting is that artists already know how to deal with intellectual property. This mm -hmm. is what we do. We, we work in intellectual property. That's the value of art. Right. Uh, and, and we, as in the for we're, we're in the forefront, I think in, in, a economically, uh, yeah. maybe not necessarily in dollar amounts, but right. certainly in the concept of it, uh, you know, artists mm -hmm. have always been at the forefront of of intellectual property over other disciplines. Yeah, yeah, and cultural yeah. capital. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I mean, will there be a co-opting of that? Absolutely, whatever's at the forefront always gets taken over by something else. Sure. Uh, or, or people aspire to take that over. Or people, or there's another, there's always a competing interest uh, that will challenge that forefront. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just thought about something, and I want to kind of th throw this in as as kind of a um, a, a lateral move. Um, the AI robotic artist Ida uh, just did, I think, the uh, 
I think the Carol Biennial and uh, Aiden and the robot got thrown in jail for, I think, uh, for a, a period of time for being suspected as being um, agents of intelligence. I'm not and, familiar with this, but uh, so so in other words, you know, they so yeah. there's like so it's Sophia, right? You know, and then the other one, you know, the other um, you know, kind of big AI agent, you know, um is uh the Ida robot. And mm -hmm. so uh run by um I can't remember, I think it's uh, Aiden, um, I can't remember his last thing, but he's out of Oxford. And so they were down in they were down in uh, Cairo. And she's pretty much a torso that that responds in real time to people talking to it, mm -hmm. and her arms are basically very, very mechanical. But you know, it, she's writing with a. It's kind of an extension of Harold Cohen's, uh, kind of a uh, an AI agent extension of Harold Cohen's. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> and so what happens is is that. Uh, but I thought it was really ironic in that, you know, she takes in information and you know, or she she technically or whatever you know um however we want to talk about that um but this apparatus you know brings in information and then it does some cognitive moves on and you know has these ai conversations while there's the performance of drawing which are actually i think two in which are actually two separate computation systems you know but on the other hand i think that this this notion that sophia was given Saudi citizenship and the idea that Ada was, you know, considered a potential security risk to the, to the, uh, you know, to the Egyptian state, you know, um, is very revealing of certain, you know, certain aspects of this info bio superstructure. In other words, it's, it kind of pulls it open the apparatus. Is it, or is, or is it or is it just that one sensor thought of it this way another sensor may have found it charming possibly and also the other thing is is that at the moment i'm looking at this it's anecdotal but i think the anecdote is really interesting mm -hmm. you know whether i'm I, i'm looking at it now i'm i'm probably going to go look for it on snopes today but you know it's just a matter that i don't think it's going to be up because it's too obscure but i like the idea i i like the notion of the story rather than it's yeah, yeah. Well, i mean look we we are fascinated with stories as human beings this is yes. the idea of storytelling has been with us since since we became a species since we developed speech since we're able to communicate story from one to the next yeah exactly I mean, that's what we did that's what we were doing yeah. This, so, this is yeah, yeah. I, I i kind of i kind of talked to some uh, uh some my uh, you know some uh, yeah, i talked to you know colleagues and i i basically do the stick figure up there and i said guess what we haven't gotten past this Forty thousand years we haven't gotten past this you know this is what we've been doing for, for two million or two million however yeah you know, however long but you know when when uh you know, uh, when that artist in the, the Mel Brooks film, you know, <laughs> did the first did the first art, and um, you know the matters that's the, that's the art critic. Yes, of course. And thank you for bringing that up. And the um, I was hoping for that. And the um, you know, and in, in many ways, you know, I've been studying you know petroglyphs, and you know, down through the avant garde and down through the. You know, it's just this notion of self -re self representation of our our humanity yeah. that you know is at the base you know of all of this. And I think what's happening here is is that where your work feeds into this is you know kind of almost an inflection, you know, of that of of that gaze, you know, to you know the material circumstances of that stick figure. You know, it's interesting because I think. When you were discussing the petroglyphs, and we're trying to think of this as like these ancient words, we're trying to think of this, and then we're trying to bring this to yeah. the new technology works. I think we tend to forget that all art was contemporary art at some time, and that artists have always held up a mirror to society. Artists have always embedded their their it, artists have always taken what's happening around them and portrayed that a story yeah so i find you know so i think that's probably a really interesting point for us to to wrap up on as to how i think so. everything of how every work is contemporary work and it's just that the yeah. tools of the work change whether they're petroglyphs from right. hundreds 
thousands of years ago to, or whether we're using an AI bot uh, sure. today. I mean, it's, and, it's, and even and going that, back, there's a reflection. That is a reflection yeah. of our society at the moment. Yeah, and Kandinsky's, you know, you know, uh, maxim of art being a child of its own time, you Absolutely. know, and the and the other thing is that even though we resonate with things again and again and again, it's really that re it's it's a resonance that repeats itself through time that reflects the context into which we're at. Absolutely, yes.